Hey, welcome to another edition of Kyle Meredith with it's the interview series presented by WFPK at WFPK.org Consequence and the Consequence Podcast Network. Thanks as always for making your way here, checking out the series. You know what to do. If you like what you see, what you hear, hit that subscribe button. I do put out three new interviews every single week, so it's a great way to keep up with all of your favorite artists. I'm so honored today and excited to be talking with Janice Ian, who's back with a brand new record. Hello. Hi, Kyle. It's great to see consequence of sound. Yes, my life has been about the consequences of making sound. And you've done some had some great conssequences because of those. In fact, I think you've affected a lot Absolutely. of uh, consequ- people's consequences because of those Absolutely. songs. So um, the new album is called The Light at the End of the Line. And that is uh, a message that means more than just an album title. Uh, as I read, uh, it feels like the most obvious spot to uh, to start here because we're told this is the last musical statements on album is is that is that the right way to say it i would say last solo studio album yeah i don't want to shut the door on doing things with other artists because I, I love recording with other artists and i love working on projects but i don't have any intention of making another solo studio album this one was 15 years since the last one and um uh, i've never said it before about an album but i think this is my best album It says everything I wanted to say the way that I'm pleased to say it. And having been lucky enough to be born with a lot of talent, uh, it's the first time in my life I felt like I really lived up to the talent I was born with. Yeah. And that's the monkey on the back of any artist is, are you doing the best you can? Are you living up to what you're capable of? That's the first time in my life I really feel like I've done it for an entire album. Yeah. It's such a good record. And I should have already complimented you on that because I have not okay. I have not been able to stop listening to it since it was sent over to me. Um, Thanks. Oh, man, the way it sounds, the poetry on it, the songs, the hooks. I mean, everything you Thank want you. out of a song. It's so So you said it. It, it has everything that you wanted to say when you know it's going to be the last studio album, as you've said. Um, were there specific things that you knew that you wanted to say? No, and I, I didn't really think about all of that part of it until we were partially assembled and I was looking at all of the songs and I thought, wow, this is really everything that if I was making a final statement, I would be very proud to have this be my final statement. And then I thought, wait a minute, I'm 70. It probably is my final statement. Okay, then. So when you when you turn 120 and your last album is 50 <laughs> years in the past, what are you going to do? <laughs> um, I don't know. Will there be albums then? You know, will we be transmitting through brainwaves? I don't know. Yeah, that's uh, the future to see anyway right there. Anybody's to guess. Yeah. yeah. Well, so when did you then decide? When, I mean, uh, what, I guess you're talking. Maybe, maybe you're talking about that moment. I mean, do, was was it before the album was made? Did you say this? There, there is going to be a last one, or did, was that also something that came later? It, it sort of. Oh, I hate hate saying it this way. It it kind of evolved, man. It evolved. Um, you know, I've been doing this since I was twelve, mm-hmm. so that's a long time, and I've been doing it full time since I was fourteen. So that's a long time as well. And there comes a point, I think, where you go through different stages. You you go through the stage of you want to be a Beatle. You want to be really, 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 really famous. And then you want to be, you want to prove things to your family. You want to prove things to your schoolmates, to your peers. Then you want to prove things to your peers in the business you're in. You reach a point where you realize that that's not that important. And what you have to do is prove things to yourself. And I hit that point, and I thought, At Seventeen's a wonderful song. Society's Child, Jesse, those are wonderful songs. They're, they're amazing songs to have written and to be a part of, and that they still live on is incredible. But then what do you do when everybody says, well, where's the next Seventeen? Where's the next hit record? You can either keep grabbing at that brass ring that you can never reach, and when you do... If you do, it's only brass, not even silver. Um, or you can say, I'm, I'm not going to worry about any of that. I'm going to do the best that I can. So that was a decision I came to about 30 years ago. Um, and then I started thinking 20 years ago, well, then how do I get off this merry-go-round? The world I was brought up in, you made an album, 
you went on tour, you wrote the next album, you made the album, you went on tour, you wrote the next album. That's how you lived. Uh, if you were a certain kind of artist, maybe you did some TV, maybe you did a movie in between, but that's what you lived with. And um, it doesn't leave a lot of time for being creative because you're always working toward this um, industry concept of what your success should look like as opposed to what you think your success should look like. So for me, there came a point about 10 years ago where I said there needs to be a stopping point where I don't have so many obligations. I don't have so many worries. I don't have this stuff on my back all the time. And when is it? And so I set a date. I said, by the time I'm 70, I want to stay home and I want to write. And then came COVID. And uh, the idea that I would do the U.S. two years ago and Europe last year kind of got blown up along with everybody else's plans. And then I started this project, BetterTimesWillCome.com, and realized how much I loved working with other musicians and how much I wanted to concentrate on the creative part instead of the mechanics. And then I put together the album and went all right, if I'm going to cram three years of touring in one year, then I'm going to also say, and after that, it's it. Yeah. I mean... Um, that was a very long-winded explanation. Sorry about that. Yeah, personally speaking, I, I've always been more of a fan of the uh, the miniseries than just the show <laughs> that goes on forever and eventually starts writing itself in circles. Uh, I can um, I can honestly say that, you know, as a fan of your catalog, I never feel like you were writing in circles, but uh, but in the... In the TV world, if we're if we're, if I'm sticking with that one right there, uh, you know, I, I like having an ending. I do, uh, even though the ending doesn't have to be the ending ending, but it's it's you know there's some some kind of finality to say, okay, this part of that story, yeah, there that is. Yeah, there. well done. Yeah. So so the hard thing I think for people to understand who are not in this business is that the tendency is when someone like me isn't having a hit record or on the radio a lot or on TV or in the press, the tendency is to assume we're dead or to assume that we can't get work. People never think somebody like me might go away for five years to be a better writer, mm -hmm. to learn to write in a different form, to do other projects. In my mind, touring in North America will be over. Making albums for myself will be over. But I'm still a writer. Mm -hmm. I'm still a player. I'm still a singer. None of that changes. So I guess it, it's a perception thing, also, because I uh, I like happy endings. Yeah, I, I'm with you. I like an ending. I like it to be wrapped up nicely. The Sopranos made me crazy, <laughs> because what kind of an ending was that? Mm. I mean, what happened? It's a cop out. You know, to this day. Yeah, you know, the, yeah, I thought the, the whole the whole ambiguous like. Let the audience aside. That, that, I'm always. Uh, I'll throw the shoe at the screen. That's that's uh, no. It's <laughs> not my job to figure out your ending, buddy. It's <laughs> that's right, and 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 that's not why you're paying us. You know, you know, the audience isn't paying us for them to do the work. It is a two way street. There's no doubt that the audience influenced the performance, but like Livingston Taylor always says, you know, we performers should get down on our knees because. We are not paying the audience to attend. They are paying us, even if it's only in time. Yeah. They're paying us to do our best. And uh, I agree with you. I'd throw a shoe. <laughs> I'd probably throw a whole lot more than a shoe. Uh, your best is far and above a lot of bests, um, I, I can say. And, and, and I do. This album, I agree. It's, it's fantastic. And for what you've said in just the last little bit here, um, especially the last record being you know, over a decade ago and what you might have been doing. Is this a different, um, are there new tricks on here on this uh, that, that you can hear or, uh, as a writer? Oh yeah, I think so. Um, the collaborations are very different. We couldn't do any of it in the studio, which is how I've always made my records. So that's a huge difference right there. If you take uh, something like Better Times Will Come that has, I think 21 people on it, everyone from Vince Gill to Diane Schur, and that Victor Krauss and his engineer Jared assembled piece by piece and that we would then get on the phone and listen to together and I'd go, 
yeah, but if you move this here and then he go, okay, and then we can move this here. Um, there's a tremendous amount of collaborative work that, that couldn't have happened the same way in the studio. Mm -hmm. So that's a difference. Being able to call on your friends for me to come and participate in something as big as Better Times Will Come, not just the song, but also the Better Times Will Come project. That's very different. I mean, having 180 people be part of a project is extraordinary. Mm -hmm. Even if it is an internet project, it's still a project. Um, if, and then you contrast that with something like Resist, which is me and Randy Liego, and I'm playing guitar, and Randy is playing everything else. That's totally different from anything I've ever done with someone. And then the rest of the album being so sparse. I originally wanted the album to just be instrument vocal, mm -hmm. instrument vocal. But then Resist was so much fun that I couldn't leave it. And Better Times, when I started thinking about Ben Skill taking a guitar solo, I thought, <laughs> and John Cowan could sing, and then Andrea Zahn could sing and play, you know. But then a lot of the songs, like Stranger, are, I think, um, as the writer, I think, deceptively simple. Mm. And something like um, Dark Side of the Sun, where there's just that huge, fat guitar sound and a vocal that's filled with compassion for Lucifer. Um, there are things that I've never even tried before. There's there's little Easter eggs. There's there's shout outs to Society's Child's mm -hmm. arrangement. There's there's little hidden things here and there. A shout out to stars in the guitar part. Um, I've never done stuff like that before. Just sat back and gone, what can I do to just pay homage to producers I've worked with and things like that. Yeah. I was hoping so. I was hoping I was hearing that that stuff right. Um because there were the, <laughs> there were those moments. Uh, you know, I wrote like there was some obvious stuff to me that I wondered if it was calling back. Like when you have a song called New York in the summer and you have a song called New York in the springtime. Um, yeah, I hadn't thought of that. Yeah, yeah. Better times I'm gonna steal that. Yeah, well better times will come as we're talking about it. Um that scatting uh is really reminiscent of uh Love You More Than Yesterday. You know. Ah, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, that's Deedles. I mean, that's not me. Right, that's Gat. Right, that's that's right. pure Diane. Yeah, but but th there were those moments. Um, and, and maybe it's too. You, maybe I'm you know, listening because I want to hear those. When I heard "Perfect Little Girl" the first time, it was impossible for me to go. Are we hearing a similar voice as at seventeen? You know, and in, in, in that hmm. kind of way. You know, so when you're writing these songs. You are leaving the Easter eggs, but were there any of those moments where you said I that you did that you purposely did want to write directly to a song from your past? I don't know if it's a continuation. I'm not yeah, asking for a sequel, yeah. but you know, in, in the same vein like that. Yeah, I, th I think the light at the end of the line goes right back to stars. Mm -hmm. To me, as a writer, if you look at any writer's catalog, you can draw lines from this song to this song to this song. So. From Society's Child, it resist is a logical outgrowth to me of Society's Child. Um, the light at the end of the line is a tip of the hat to stars. Stars is all about what it was like to be a star and then not be a star and then be trying to come back and be a star again. The light at the end of the line is all about having been a star and not a star and then a star and then not a star, having done this with my career gratitude to the people who've hung in there yeah yeah so yeah yeah i mean i was very conscious of that when i was writing that song in particular i gotta think that's a very fun thing to do though as a writer to to have a catalog deep enough and and to go back far enough that you can do those things i mean uh, you know if we're if we're using the movie example again a lot of my favorite uh directors will do the same thing you know little parts a previous or they'll do a little homage like um like that uh, what is it the player where they have that really long shot at the beginning and and you go back to orson wells uh and inventing that that style and the the apparatus to use with the camera so that they could do that longer continuous shot yeah yeah absolutely absolutely um uh, yeah i think it's fun to be able to say to somebody like randy hey put an organ lick at the end let's let's give a shout out to artie butler and society's child that's pretty cool yeah well, you know, as we're talking about stars, uh, famously covered by a lot of folks, Nina uh, Simone being one of those. And here you have a song called Nina. And the first thought is, is this that Nina? Or are we hearing about Nina Simone? 
Kyle, I tried to make that song about anybody but Nina. I really, you know, there's a point where I always tell students when I give master classes, you've got to let your talent take its head. You really have to trust your talent. And yet sometimes you're really not happy about it. And I loved Nina, and she was very difficult to love. Um, I learned more from Nina in a 10-minute performance than I learned from most performers in two or three hours. Yeah, I admired, respected, loved, adored, you, you name it. And yet she was so hard. And once I realized that the song wouldn't go anywhere but to be about Nina, um, it, it became fun in a sad kind of way because I, I really think that Nina was um, mentally ill in a way that it doesn't excuse the behavior, but it explains it. Mm -hmm. And I, I, you hear a lot about artists being crazy. I, I think that the the best artists are usually very far from crazy or very far from mentally ill because we, we don't have... I, I don't know how to put this properly, politically, correctly. But Nina was genuinely, biologically ill. And I wish I'd understood more about it when I knew her because I think I would have behaved differently sometimes and I feel bad about it. It was hard in that song to get across how much I adored her and yet she was crazy as a loon. It, it, when I when I came up with the phrase "crazy as a loon in your own cartoon," what what a world this those eyes must see. All I could think was, yeah, I I will never be able to see the world that Nina saw with those eyes, and so I can't really judge her mm -hmm. at this point. I can't say why or how or whether she should have done a lot of the things that she did or behaved like she did. All I can say is that. Sometimes she broke my heart and she would put it right in the ground and step on it and squeeze it into the dirt. And other times she would lift it up so high I felt like I was going to be burned by the sun. Yeah, wow. That, I mean, the the melody and that gentle piano, I had it in my headphones, actual headphones, big headphones, not the little earbuds, but um, and just hearing the room during that song and, and again, not knowing if it's about her or, or not, and only knowing about your relationship, but of course, I've read on the internets or, or in articles or stuff, something like that, you know, but thinking that if it, if it was uh, about her, as, as my thought process was at the time, these lyrics could only come from someone, from a friend, from someone who actually mm. knew beyond the myth, you know, as, as these things go. I think you're right. Yeah, I think you're right. And and that's the other thing about this album. Um, I work a lot with a gentleman named Jeff Evans, who probably knows my catalog better than I do. And he had sent me a couple of things for some reason, and they were so good. And I, I said, when did I cut these? And he said, these are just work tapes. You just did them at home or in the studio when you'd finished a song. And I, to my embarrassment, I thought the vocals were a lot better than what I was doing in the studio for albums. So, for instance, with Nina, that's the work tape. That's mm -hmm. the first time I ever played that song wow. in a studio. And I had a great engineer, but it's a first take. A lot of the things on this are first takes. In fact, I think, I think all of them are first takes. Um, it's pretty humbling to realize that a lot of what you've been doing all of your life uh, could be bettered by just a nanosecond of, hey, here's a new song, boom. Yeah. In that sense, maybe Dylan was right all along. Well, I've always been a big champion of demoitis. Uh, I mean, it's, <laughs> it, it's it, it is hurtful sometimes when you've got to adapt to the different version. But uh, but but in that same vein, it's like you know I suffer from that first version I hear that I fall in love with. You can't get any better than that. Absolutely, absolutely, and I've I've come to appreciate that a whole lot more. So that's another another very different thing about this album. It's probably the least artificial. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, I, I hate the way this word is overused, but it's the most authentic, off-the-cuff album I've done. I mean, even even something like the vocal on, my vocal on Better Times Will Come, when I did it originally, I sang it into my phone, and I didn't want to do that, but I did want the feel of it. 
So I sat in John's studio and literally just started singing. Mm -hmm. Didn't worry about vocal, didn't worry about mic work, didn't worry about any of that. Just sang. Yeah. Well, I know there's um, you know, a couple songs, few songs maybe that had been around for a little while at least. Uh, the the first single I'm still standing, I think maybe you had originally released, if I read right, in 2014. You know, and 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 of course, of course, having that song as your lead single when you have the pretext of, and this is my final studio album, you know, did that song say the same things six, seven years ago that you feel it says now, or did that change for you? And and maybe in the factor why you brought it back for this record. I just thought it was a really, I think it's a really good song. It's a really universal song. And the album that it was released on, Strictly Solo, was originally intended just as a fundraiser for our Pearl Foundation. So, um, and then it was out for a blip. But I really to reach a wider audience. That's, you know, there's there's no magic behind the thought. Mm -hmm. It's just the idea. Yeah, it's a fun song. I mean, uh, and, and, you know, even the heavier songs, you know, we've talked about uh, uh, Resist. That's a very heavy song. And it's such a fun song. I mean, good. There's a good, good. Yeah, dose of humor that, that goes along with it. But you're, you are, you're driving a point, a very, a very important point uh, uh, home. Um, I, I hope you don't mind just the broad question of can, can you tell me about how this song came about, what you wanted from it? Um, I started with the Yoko Ono line, woman is the, I don't know how to say it politically correctly, so N-word mm -hmm. of the world. Mm -hmm. um, I love that concept. And the more that I thought about it, the more I thought, yeah, we're fifty percent of the world, and until we get that sorted out, not not just for women, but for men who are stuck with being macho and having to prove themselves all the time, and growing up in a culture many times where hitting a woman is considered the way you train her, and women are chattel, we have to we have to be kind to men about that too, and be willing to dialogue with them, and and teach them, um, and learn from them. So I started from that premise, and then I got annoyed. <laughs> I can't remember what did it to me, but I got really angry one day about something to do with being female. Ah, oh, somebody made the mistake of saying to me, why haven't you ever been on the cover of a guitar magazine? And I said, because they won't allow women. Women don't sell magazines. I didn't even think about it as I said it. And then I thought, what am I? What? What? That's like when I was a kid. Everybody said women couldn't sell as many records as men, and Whitney Houston then blew the roof off that. Mm -hmm. But still, you haven't seen a woman head of a major label, major publishing company? You haven't seen that in the music industry. You don't see women program directors in general? Mm -hmm. Theater, it's changed a bit. You, you see a lot of women production managers now. You see a lot of women lighting directors, women stage managers, not not in sound. Sound is a boys club. Mm -hmm. I mean, I deliberately worked with uh, Piper Payne, who is as good as I've worked with as a mastering engineer, um, but in part deliberately because she was female and I knew that women don't get as many shots. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to work with a woman because she's almost as good, but I'd rather give a woman a shot, just like I didn't get the shots. Mm -hmm. And then I started remembering being 13 and memorizing the lick to a satisfaction. Going to try and belong to a band and all the guys going, man, that was great, but you're a girl. That was the end of the discussion. Wow. So as women, we grow up without that camaraderie that men grow up with in the music business. Uh, we don't hang out on the golf course with the boys. Mm. We don't get to be on the bus with the boys. We don't have access a lot of the time. And I think somebody like Miranda Lambert is doing an amazing job of counteracting that. But in the meanwhile, somebody like me is still dealing with a childhood of hearing, oh, you play guitar in your own records, really? Well, you don't need to play it on TV, though, do you? Challenges that I doubt a male would have heard and that started to annoy me mm -hmm. it started to really get me angry then i started thinking about things that people took for normal like female genital mutilation there's a whole world that takes that as normal and desirable and 
I'll tell you, Kyle, so writing some of that song made me very uncomfortable. Singing it made me very uncomfortable. Um, but then there were other areas like the fa 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 funny <laughs> that I thought, well, that was just fun because I got my point across, but I can still be played on radio, although some stations won't play it. Um, present company accepted. But I got my point across in a way that was not in your face. Mm -hmm. and, it, and it's hard to write a song that says ugly things without being in your face and making you want to turn the radio off mm -hmm. or the record off or whatever you're listening to. But these are the songs that tend to live the longest. They, you know, you pulled off a magic trick and, and, and not saying, yeah, well, yeah, there's magic in that song. You know, it's, it's just kind of obvious the first time you hear it. And, and so many of the tracks on here. Um, I, I'm fearful of, of, of pushing past what we were talking about because I love what you're saying, but I also know we're up against the clock right now. Yeah, sorry. That I, I will just quickly ask, the, the record ends with, you know, better times will come and, and everything that you're talking about. Um, is that an optimistic, actual optimistic statement at the end or hopeful? It's, a, it's an optimistic clinging to it statement. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, I'm, I'm clinging to it. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, because uh, they've got to. Human history does that. You know, we pendulum swings once, then it swings back, then it writes itself eventually. We survived the Black Plague. We survived World War II and World War I. We're surviving technology. I, I think we can survive. Whether we will come out as a kinder, gentler race or species, mm -hmm. I don't know. Um, but I think we can survive and do better than mere survival. I've got to believe that because otherwise, if you don't believe that, what's the point in going on? Right. Well, you've given us a good soundtrack for whatever that future is, and I can't thank you enough for that. Thank you. Yeah, Janice, it has really been an honor so much to talk to you. Uh, thank you. Congratulations on this album and and held over 60 years or whatever, maybe of uh, near 60 years of, of, of amazing albums. Way too long, way too long. <laughs> All right. It was such a pleasure. Thank you so much for doing this. Thank you. Much appreciated. All right. And we'll, Thank you, we'll Kyle. We'll see you around. Good question. Take care. Hope so. Yep. See you Bye. soon.